to remove every bit of friction between them and you, almost like they're your best friend. Like, does your best friend have your, your support at yourbusiness.com email when they want to hit you up? No, they got your cell number. And so that's kind of how it has to be in the early days. It, it really does. And, and, and this, this stuff sounds so simple and maybe even obvious, but, but 90% of, of new founders don't do it. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to another Knowledge Bomb episode of Lead to Greatness. Well, we believe in helping others reach their greatest potential, and together we can change the world. Today on Lead to Greatness, we have Brian Clayton. Brian is the CEO and co-founder of GreenPow, an online marketing place that connects homeowners with local lung care professionals. GreenPow has been called the Uber of lung care by Entrepreneur Magazine and have over 200,000 active users, completing thousands of transactions per day. Please help me welcome Brian with how to build an eight-figure business with no outside capital. This is Cedric Francis, and you're listening to the Lead to Greatness. My name is Brian Clayton. I am the CEO and co-founder of a company called GreenPal. So GreenPal is the mobile app that is like Uber but for lawn mowing. So if you're a homeowner and need to get your lawn mowed rather than calling around on Craigslist or Facebook or something silly like that, you just download GreenPal, pop your address in and somebody will come out and mow your yard for you and pay them right through the app and then schedule them right through the app for the whole season. And it just kind of happens like clockwork. GreenPal is a nine year overnight success. Uh, we've been at this, my co-founders and I, for almost a decade, but now we're nationwide in the United States, about 300,000 people using the app to get this chore done and doing multiple eight figures a year in revenue. And we self-funded the business off of its own revenue the whole, the whole way through, haven't taken on any outside capital. So kind of rare for tech startups, but that's how we did it. Wow. That is amazing. That is amazing. What, what was going on? How did this come about? Let's talk about it. Yeah. So I think when it comes to like, starting a new business, starting a tech startup or starting a new business, you can, you can use authenticity as a competitive advantage. And so for me, my first company was a lawn mowing business. I started mowing grass when I was just 15 years old to make extra cash. And uh, I kept mowing grass all through high school and college. And when I graduated college, I decided to go all in on the lawn mowing business. And wow. over a 15 year period of time, I, my team and I built one of the largest landscaping companies in the state of Tennessee, where I live, nice. eventually getting that company over eight figures in revenue. And in 2013, the business was, was acquired by one of the larger landscaping businesses in the United States. And so I guess you could say I had the lawn care business in my DNA. It was the only thing I, I had ever done and known. Uh, I never had a job, never worked for anybody. It always just ran my own landscaping company. And, and so when I sold that business, I, I was able to retire. I didn't have to work anymore, and, but I was still very young. I, I still, uh, I, I had this kind of like desire to want to get back in the game. And I took some time off and I got bored and I thought, well, what now? And I thought, well, I see apps helping, you know, with real world transactions, make them happen more smoothly and, and more cost effective. And, and so I thought, well, if Uber can do it for car sharing and Airbnb can do it for couches, let me see if I can do this for, for the service I know. And so I, I guess you could say it was naivete as an asset, because if I had known how hard it was going to be to, to build this app and build this marketplace, I never would have done it. But uh, recruited two co-founders, we put our heads down, we started working. And we got a we got an app out in the marketplace and was able to hustle up 100 people to use it and and listen to everything those people would tell us about everywhere the app sucked and it didn't work and everywhere they wished that it would improve. And so we just listened to that feedback, made it better and better and better. And we've been doing that for almost a decade. And here we are uh, 10 years in and we're still doing one thing making ordering a lawn mowing service cheaper, faster, quicker, more predictable, more seamless, more cost effective. Uh, and, and, and we focus on this one chore, this one problem for, for 10 years. And so the idea was kind of the same then as it is now, but how we've gotten to where we are today has, has meandered and zigzagged all along the way. It's this weird dichotomy when you're starting a new business from scratch and starting a new company. There's this dichotomy of persistence, but flexibility. It's like a yin and a yang. Like you have to be flexible to figure it out as you go. And you also have to be persistent to not give up. And one thing that I have kind of seen and observed over the last 10 years building GreenPal is that startups fail. They fail all the time. They fail more times than not, but entrepreneurs don't fail. 
And, and so while startups fail, entrepreneurs always win because the entrepreneur is, is the true entrepreneur is going to figure out a way to, to be successful. He's going to fit, he or she are going to figure out a way to learn from the mistakes and kind of adapt and pivot along the way to find something that works. And so, so for me, the things that kind of caught me off guard, you know, here I am, I'm, I'm 15 years of business under experience under my belt. I just sold a, a business that was doing $8 million a year. So here I think I'm like a king of the hill. Like I, I know everything there is to know about business building. And so I start green pal and I'm quickly confronted with all these things that I, wow, I, I realized I didn't really know much of anything about, about business building, particularly tech, tech startups. And so one thing was like, there's a big difference between starting a traditional small business and inventing a new product from scratch. And so I was inventing something brand new that, that nobody had ever used before. Nobody had ever picked up their phone, launched an app, pushed a button. Somebody magically came out and mowed the yard that had never happened before. And, and so we were inventing that. And so we had kind of had to figure it out, you know, okay, well, what is the, what do the lawn care services need and what do they want to see out of it? So they'll use it. And then what do consumers expect and what do they need? And how do we strike a balance between the two? And it was just hundreds and thousands of, of iterations, figuring out how to craft the product and how to craft and invent the product from scratch that just took a long time. And I had no idea. I had no idea that, that that's how it was going to be, but it's how, how it ended up. You look at these huge successes and they seem like they happened overnight, but 99.9% .9 of the time they did not uh, A lot of times you're not looking at two or three years. You're looking at seven, 10 or 15 years. Okay. That entrepreneur or that founder already crashed and burned on two or three other projects. And they were plowing all of the experience that they had from those failures into this one thing that did work. Or maybe this one thing that did work was named something different. And they were actually been working on it for 15 years and not the three that you saw in the tech press. So, right. so there, there are no overnight successes. It, it takes five or 10 years to get anything going. And you have to have that, that flexibility and persistence to see it through. That, that is awesome. I want to talk about this because us entrepreneurs, we have our baby, we have our idea. And in our minds, our idea is the best idea. One of the last things most people want to hear, although we do know feedback is important, uh, every time you do something with some of the larger companies, you know, whether it's customer service or whatever the case may be, they always ask them for feedback. But small startups don't quite, you know, enjoy the feedback process, you know, like the larger companies that realize feedback is important. How did you get from the startup that, you know what, this is my baby, I think my idea is better, to getting to the aspect of what some of these larger companies doing and asking for that feedback. Let's talk about the journey from you beginning the feedback to where you are now with feedback and how you embrace feedback and the benefit of it. I can definitely empathize with our tendencies as founders and entrepreneurs to be, to be resistant to that feedback because to get one of these things going it's an extension of yourself. It's your soul in the project. It, it literally is like everything that you've got. Yeah. You're seven days a week trying to get this thing going. And then somebody just tells you, you suck <laughs> and it hurts. It really hurts. And so the, the tendency is, is to say, well, that hurt. I don't want that. And they're stupid. So don't even listen to it. Yeah. But the reality is, is that, that that's your only lifeblood that, that, that there, there's always this gap between founder logic and customer logic and feedback is the only thing that closes that gap mm. and so if you let that gap exist you're you're really just kind of operating on on hope and luck and you're not operating on any sort of of uh, really free r d coming from your users so the reality is, is, is to have a shot at, at building a new product from scratch, starting a new company. Your cell phone number needs to be on the emails. Your cell phone number needs to be on the homepage. You're, you know, you need to do the live chat yourself. You need to do the feedback and you, I mean, you need to do the support because you need that. That's like free R and D for, for you to figure out where you're going and you're, where you're figuring out what you're trying to do. And a lot of times um, as a founder, even, even in the early days, your job is, is one of what's called a capital allocator. And so you may only have $10,000 to allocate, but you got to know where to allocate it. Do you mm -hmm. allocate it on new features? Do you allocate it on hiring a new developer? Do you allocate it on better advertising? Do you allocate it on better branding? Whatever. 
And these are bets that you're making. And the only way to know how to make smart bets is the customer feedback, because you're going to hear the same five or 10 problems on a daily basis. And that's where you're going to need, that's where it's going to help you guide you to, to where you triage and where you allocate what little resources you have. And so while the feedback hurts, it stings, it's not fun. The, the marketplace is a relentless purveyor of feedback. It's always going to tell you who, where you, where you stink. Um, you need that. You need to make it really simple and frictionless for, for, for people to speak to you, to tell you what you need to be working on, particularly in their early days, or else you could just, you know, waste five years of your life. Mm, that's good. That is a load of knowledge bomb. Wow. Here, here, here's the thing. So with feedback, do you need to ask for feedback or the customer's just going to give it to you? Both, but you do need to be, you do need to be proactive about asking people how you're doing. And, and so these could be just, you know, everything from uh, email trigger event, you know, a couple of days after somebody did business with you or a text message event, Hey, let us know how we're doing. And in the early days, that text message just needs to come back to your phone. <laughs> like, like, cause you may only have a hundred customers, you know, you, it's not like you need some sophisticated, robust feedback collection system. You literally just need something as simple as the hundred people doing business with you need to be able to text and call you. So on the one hand, if you, if you're coming up short, they're going to let you know. But on the other hand, you do need to be proactive about soliciting that and you need to remove all the friction for them to be able to tell you. So it's like the email needs to go back to, to your email inbox. It doesn't need to go to at support at yourbusiness.com. It needs to go to your name at yourbusiness.com. Uh, the text message needs to hit you up on your cell phone seven days a week. Once you get thousands and tens of thousands of customers, like, you know, we have a few hundred thousand customers now. My cell number is not everywhere out there, but the first several thousand people that use GreenPal, I talked to personally. They had my cell number. Many of them I met with face-to-face -face because I, that feedback is everything. There is a, uh, a book called The Lean Startup by Eric Reese, which is a really good book about how to build a product from, from zero, like, like what we're talking about here. And, and really what all that book is about is about getting out of the building, getting out from behind the laptop and talking to your customers and letting them guide the process of, of decisions that you're making. And not necessarily just being like whipped in every direction by every complaint, but literally harnessing all of that feedback and then collating it, understanding, okay, these are the really two or three things that are important that everybody's talking about that they wish that we did differently. Let's, let's, let's start acting on those. You, you said something, I want you to touch on this because you mentioned you, you gave them your email and not some business email at this. Why is that important? Well, particularly in the early days, you, you, your dozen, your first dozen customers, 20 customers, hundred customers, you need a personal relationship with them. They're gold. Uh, and they're not just gold because you need the sales and you do, you know, you need the revenue, but you need, you need the testers, you need the people to, to, to help you figure out what it is you're doing. And so, so you need that personal relationship with them. And the way to do that is just to remove every bit of friction between them and you almost like they're your best friend. Like, does your best friend have your, your support at your business.com email when they want to hit you up? No, they got your cell number. Yeah. And so that's kind of how it has to be in the early days. It, it really does. And, and, and this, this stuff sounds so simple and maybe even obvious, but, but 90% of, of new founders don't do it. And then the, the problem is, is that they, they waste two or three or four years working on something that doesn't matter that people don't want. And, and then they get bitter and then they give up. And so you can save yourself a lot of that headache. If, if you'll just literally get Go meet these folks at Starbucks, go meet them at their coffee table and let them tell you everywhere that they wish that you were better. And then after you start hearing that, you'll, you'll never be at a loss for what do I do? Yeah. You'll never be at a loss for what should I be working on this week? Cause you'll know is it'll be just like in your, like ingrained in your soul. Cause you're hearing it all the time. Brian, that is a, another knowledge bomb. Wow. And you can do this stuff way on into scale mode too. I mean, where, where you're not having to talk to a thousand people a day, you can make it sa seem like you are, but that aside, no. you have to do it in the early days because, because you, you need a personal relationship with those first dozen or hundred people. Um, if, and this is one of the things that you can do as a competitive advantage against the big guys. You know, it's one of the, one of the levers you can pull. And if you think of business as like a video game, you know, 10, Mar 10 levels of Super Mario Brothers, you know, to get through level one, two, and three, these are the types of things you got to be doing. Mm -hmm. you, you don't really can't even worry about Bowser. You just got to get through level one, two, or three, throw up the flag and get on to the next level. And one of the ways you do that is to do these sorts of things that don't scale, but they, they give you insights 
They help you make sure that you're making the best bets that you can and, and make your customers as sticky as possible. And they get you on to the next level. So let's, let's get our first hundred customers and then we'll figure out how to get to a thousand. I love this. I love this. I want you to do this real quick. Uh, you talked about levels and I love this. So let's talk about level one, two, and three. So as far as level one, what, what should we be focused on in level one? Yes. Yeah. So, so every business has, yeah, I would guess three phases. So you got your startup, your grow up, your scale up. Hmm. And so startup, startup phase could be metaphorically or theoretically levels one, two, three, and four. And so startup is I have nothing. I'm trying to create a business, a product or a service and something that, that will, that will add value to my customers that they will pay for and they will continue to pay for. And that might be level one and two. And so level one might be, I just need 12 people. I need to get something in the hands of 12 people hmm. and I need to listen to those 12 people. And then I need to get that to 50 people. And that might be level one and two. And you will learn more by doing that than, than, than worrying about level seven, eight, and nine stuff. The problem is people try to start on seven, eight, and nine. Absolutely. And then it's like theoretically watching everything on YouTube and, and, they're, and they're making business plans and budgets and projections and, and, board and brand uh, uh, standards, manuals, and, and culture-related stuff. Like none of that matters at this stage of the game. We've just got to get something in the hands of customers because you will learn so much more doing that than any of this other stuff. And, and so uh, I like, that's how it's made sense to me 20 years in business is that, is that this is how, how, how it's happened for me twice now. It's like the, the startup, the grow up, the scale up, just work, just work your way through these metaphorical levels, lay, actually lay them out maybe even as, as actual goals and don't even worry about anything else really. Uh, let's get our first hundred customers. Let's get our first 5K a, a month in revenue and then not worry about anything else until we do that. All right, uh, man, that's another knowledge bump. This podcast today is going to save people three to five years of frustration getting to what you just identified, levels, levels, taking care of one thing at a time. Don't worry about yep. trying to make a million when you haven't made a thousand yet. Focus on that thousand, yep. then focus on that million. I love it. Brian, this is great. This is great. I really thank you. So, here it is. You, you talked about Green Pal and you talked about the, the levels in the process between the last decade of doing this. And you talked about a business before. This is not your first rodeo. So what was different from the first and the second? Yeah, it's a great question because it was a big transition. So the first company was a traditional landscaping company, uh, lawnmowers, trucks, trailers. At one point in time, I had three full-time mechanics that worked for me. All they did was fix trucks and lawnmowers all day. And it was about as blue collar and traditional business as you could get. Yeah. And it was a tough business to run, but it was one that my team and I did good at. And so did, did that, built that, sold that. And then, and then now I thought, well, you know, now I'm going to start a software business. That'll be so much easier because <laughs> I won't have all of these employees. I won't have all of these laborers. I won't have all of this equipment that's breaking down all the time. So this will be so much easier. And what I didn't realize is that it's 10 times harder because you, you are creating something that people use. And so you're inventing something brand new and you kind of have to figure that out. And you kind of, there is no roadmap. Like, you know, when I built my first landscaping business, one way that I did that was I, I grew, you know, this was in Nashville, Tennessee, where we operated, but I would go to Chicago, Miami, the New York area. And I would try to meet with, with other players uh, in, in those markets and try to learn from what they were doing. And then I would just fast follow what they were doing and then do it in my market, which was like a quarter of the size. And I was running circles around my competition because I was learning from guys that were doing it at a much bigger scale than I was and doing it in my local market. So that was like a little playbook, a little hack, if you will, that I did. Well, that didn't work building green pal because nobody was doing what we were doing. Now I could learn from Uber and Airbnb and DoorDash and Postmates and some of these other companies that were doing similar things in different industries. And, and in fact, we did do that. That was, that was one thing that made it a lot more difficult. So that was different. The other thing was we had to learn how to build software, which was really hard. And I didn't know how to build software. I didn't know the first thing about it. And I thought all we had to do was, was pay a development agency, a shop, if you will, to build what we think green pal should be. We would market that and then we would just be off and going. And we actually tried that, wasted $150,000 doing that wow. and realized real quick that this isn't, you know, that was a bust. That was a bomb. We were, and then we thought, well, if we're going to be in the tech business, we're going to have to learn how to build software. Mm -hmm. And we 
we took every online class we could take. My co-founder went to a boot camp, and like over the course of like a year or two, we learned how to build software, and and built the next version ourselves. And looking back, it was kind of as silly as you want to open up a five-star restaurant, but you've got no chef. And you've got no recipes. Wow. And not only that, you have no idea even how to develop a recipe, wow. but yet you have a great looking storefront and great looking tablecloths on the tables and nice silverware, but there is no chef. And so that's what like starting a tech company is without a technical co-founder or technical acumen. So we had to learn that stuff. So that was one thing that was really, really challenging on the second kind of uh, act of my entrepreneurial journey. Oh man, that is awesome. It's perfect leading me to the next question. So within this process, what is the greatest lesson that you learned and what was life or business before and after learning it? You know, there's a lot of things that, you know, that, that business is great because it, if you're doing it correctly, you're going to evolve into a whole new person every two or three years. And so you're going to like be gaining all of these new skills and all of this new wisdom along the way. And so I guess one thing that I learned starting Green Pal was that I could pretty much learn anything. I'm not the smartest dude. You know, I graduated high school with like a, a th maybe a 2.8 GPA and I barely got through college uh, with, a, with a similar GPA. Not a smart, not the smartest cat. I'm no genius. But one thing I was able to learn while building Green Pal was that if I was just willing to put in the time pour over the blogs, pour over the online classes, go to YouTube University um, and just take the online stuff and, and learn that I could learn anything. And, and, you know, the next thing I know, I'm reading some book on, on data analysis or, or topics like behavioral economics and stuff that, that I never would have in a million years would have gravitated towards, but the business was requiring, requiring me to learn them and, and I was picking them up. And so I guess the thing I learned was just to not to believe your own BS. You know, a lot of times we, we think we're wired a certain way and we can't do certain things because that's not who we are. Whereas, you know, a business is going to like put your back against the wall and force you to do these things. And if you can kind of get over that limitation and learn and understand about yourself that, you know, it's not that you can't, it's that you really aren't willing to. And if you're willing to put in the time and you, you can, you can surprise yourself. And that's a really cool thing that the last decade of building Green Pal has taught me. So a lot of times, you know, we didn't raise money building Green Pal. We did it ourselves and, and we didn't have like a big budget for like a product team or a designer and stuff. And so we really had no clue how to do any of this stuff. But one thing that, that we did do is I personally, I, like I made a list of, of 15 different companies that were doing similar things, Uber, Airbnb, Lyft. DoorDash, Postmates. There's a company called WAG that is for dog walking and Rover that is for dog walking. And then another company called Homejoy, which is now out of business that was made service. All of these apps were connecting buyers and sellers for real world uh, transactions. I signed up as a home cleaner on, on Homejoy. I signed up as a dog walker. I signed up as a driver and I did every one of these for like a month. And I would just take ridiculous notes and screenshots and do almost a teardown of how they built the product, how they crafted the copy, how they like sent you the push notification at the right time and the email at the right time. And I, and I, I just like created like a brief for every one of them. And that one thing, not really one thing, it took a year to, to get through all of that, maybe even longer, but that, that exercise was probably one of the reasons why we are where we are today is because I was able to fast follow a lot of these established players that had hundreds of millions of dollars of venture capital they were putting to work figuring out the nuances of order dog walking from your app i knew that i could learn from that to apply it to lawn mowing and that's something that really worked for me so if you're starting a new you know it could be a bakery a dry cleaning service it could be a hair salon or it could be the next uber for x y or z you can learn from bigger companies that are doing similar things in similar spaces and apply that to what you're doing. And you can do that for free. It doesn't cost you anything. And another knowledge bomb. Wow. Matter of fact, I made some money. I made some money walking some dogs. That is, wow. That is awesome. That is awesome. That is awesome. I love this. I love the way you're breaking this down. I love the way you're giving us insight in your process of getting from the beginning to where you are right now. And I'm, I'm looking at you right now. Those are, if you're listening on iTunes or Spotify, or one of the listening apps, you won't be able to see Brian here. But I mean, Brian is, I mean, you look at him. I mean, he, he had the shoulders. I mean, they really just poking out, right? And now he's he's putting his hand together. You uh, and everything, right? So you can see this. So he's very a, a very fit man. 
I'm listening to the process of all the things you did, right? And it puts me in the, the mindset of going to the gym, working out. I want to ask you this question. How has fitness and business benefited you as far as going through and pushing and pressing through the resistance of life, of business through fitness? Oh, wow. I love that question. And uh, so I thank you for the kind words. I, I, I appreciate that. I'm not where I want to be in, in terms of physical fitness. But when I was building Green Pal, uh, my two co-founders and I, we were seven days a week and we weren't, and we weren't working out. And, and I learned something that you do have to take care of your vessel. You got to take care of your body yeah. or else you just, you can't perform at a high level at anything else. Yeah. I mean, if you just drag, if you just run yourself down and let yourself get overweight or let yourself get out of shape, it really does affect every other aspect of life. And it, and it happened for me about year five in the green pal. And, and so my co-founder was like, well, you know, dude, I don't know what we're going to do, but, I'll, but there's the marathon in April, which is like four months away. And like, we can sign up for that and see what we can do. And, and I thought, oh, there, I hadn't even ran a mile in my life. And, and, okay. and but I, hey, let's do it because something's got to give here. I, I mean, I can't, do, I can't get into a size 42 uh, gene. I, I can't let that happen. And so we, uh, we did that. We signed up for the marathon and I started learning all of these cool things about the, the, the similarities between physical fitness and training for something like a marathon and business. And there's a lot of similarities and, and one is like consistency as a superpower, you know, showing up every day, putting in the reps, putting in the time, doing the training, whether you want to or not, it adds up. Um, another one is like, you know, when you, when you're, when you see these joggers out there and they're jogging in place at a stoplight, they look goofy and, and you're like, you know, you don't really understand until you start running 15 or 20 miles at a time, you understand that it, it, if you stop it, and it hurts to start again. Like yeah. if you stop jogging, um, it's really, really, really hard to get fired up and go again. So you jog in place because it literally is less painful. Mm -hmm. And so that consistency and momentum is the same in business. If you, if you take, if your startup is really hurting wow. and you stop and take a month off or two weeks off or two months off, there's a high degree of likelihood that you'll never fire it back up. And if you do, it's going to be super painful. So if you keep going and keep the momentum, keep driving forward, it, it, it does always uh, work out. And, and so these were neat, interesting things I learned that, that uh, uh, the, the parallels between running a marathon and training for a marathon and, and trying to get a business going from scratch were similar. And the other thing was like, I was running the marathon for me, you know, mm -hmm. nobody cared. I was running the marathon, you know, it, it was for me, I needed to do it. And I think a business has to be that way too. A lot of times we had to be intrinsically motivated to get that business going, to see that business work. You know, anybody that started something from scratch knows that, you know, nobody's going to support you through the through those first three or four levels. You know, nobody's going to like check in and make sure everything's going, nobody's going to help you out. You got to really want to see that thing happen. You're doing it for, for your intrinsic motivation and y'all training for a marathon. It's just like that too. You're doing it for you. And so these were interesting parallels that I saw between fitness and business. And, and still to this day, I see them every day. It, it, the two are really are similar. This is great. Definitely excited. I, I want to shift over because we have entrepreneurs, but we also have entrepreneurs that are leaders, that they're not in the organization by themselves, that they have someone working alongside. I, I want to ask you this. What are some leadership growth tips, tools, and advice that you can share with the Lead to Greatness community to help us reach our greatest potential? Yeah, some that that have stuck out for me the, over the 20 years in business was that one is that we're nobody we're never taught how to lead, you yeah. know, in, in school, business, college, nobody and, let, and maybe if you went to the military, but but nobody ever teaches us how to be a decent leader. And then you you start a business, and you have three people working for you. And you wonder why does everybody think I'm a jerk. <laughs> and, and, and then you realize nobody ever taught you how to lead. Nobody ever taught you how to be a decent leader. So again, one of the cool things about the business is it's going to force you to pick up some books on some leadership. Yes. And it's going to force you to, to go to some seminars on leadership. It's going to force you to become a decent leader because you'll never make it anywhere in business unless you do that. And so for me, you know, I had to, I had to come to a lot of a lot of personal like reflection moments, starting businesses and growing businesses and my leadership style developing along the way. And, and one in particular was maybe year eight of my first business. I was driving to my office and I had this pit in my stomach. I didn't want to, I didn't want to go there. I didn't like any of the people, not any, but I didn't like a lot of the people that worked there. Um, there was a bad culture. Uh, it was just a bad vibe. 
Uh, um, and, and it was just it overall just wasn't a pleasant place. And, and I was like upset. And then it hit me. It was like, I built this, you know, this is me, this is my doing, you know, and I, I, I hit me like a ton of bricks. It's like, you get exactly the culture you deserve. The, the business is just reflecting you as a person. It's just reflecting your vibe. It's reflecting your style. And so you have to change yourself first in order to improve and change the business. And so I had to go through a real, real like difficult growth phase experiencing that. And so for me, like leadership, a lot of it is, is getting the help, reading the books, working on it as trite as it sounds, it's leading by example, it's establishing not necessarily the values in the company. Everybody talks about values, but it's, it's more or less virtues. It's the things that we're doing. Like if, if one of our virtues is, is we care about the customer and we really care about the customer's success, well, then you as the leader, you have to live that. Yeah. You have to celebrate that. You have to like walk that walk and talk that talk. And, and so it, it's a lot of like less with your mouth and more with your feet. It's literally living it and breathing it. And there's no way to fake it. And I tried to fake it for a while. And then I had to, I had to learn the hard way that no, you can't fake this stuff. And, and so, and, and if I hadn't started a couple of businesses, I'd still be the same leader I was 20 years ago, which is a terrible one. And now I'm a decent one. And, and that's one of the cool things about it. One of the great things you'll get out of running your, your company is becoming a decent leader, decent manager. Hey, you got knowledge bombs out there. Every time I can take a breath and, 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 and say it, <laughs> I, I want to talk about, I, I looked at the website and, you know, I, I love Green Pal, the process of it. I showed my wife, I was so excited about it. Like, wow, I said, this is pretty awesome. And I really like what, you know, what you're doing, what you have right now, the whole process. And I know it's a lot of happy customers. Where are you going with Green Pal? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think I've never been like the hardcore five-year detailed plan kind of guy. You should be, you really should, but I've never, I've always just kind of had one or two big goals and then made some really small things day in, day out that we're doing to work against the big goals. Mm -hmm. So it's like the output metric is, is that we want to be a hundred million dollar business. Mm -hmm. That's just, that's the only thing we, that we're driving towards We're we're doing between 20 and 30 million a year right now, we want to get to hundred million. And then the input metric is, okay, well, what are the little things we got to do this week? And let's not worry about anything else. And it's doing that over and over again is, is how we kind of march our way towards it. And so that's, that's what we're doing. We, we have one big goal, hundred million in, in recurring revenue, and let's not worry about anything else. And then let's talk about the little small things we need to do to get there. And the other thing is, is like another goal is just to have fun doing this. I, I probably won't run this business the day I don't have fun doing it. And, uh, you know, I'm 42 years old now. And, and as I get older, I start to realize that, that really what I'm doing now in life is, is do I enjoy it? If I do, then I'm going to do it. If I don't, then I'm not going to do it. And so I'm enjoying running this company. I, I love running it. Uh, we have 42 people working for us now. All of them are smarter than me in some way. And so I'm going to keep running it as long as I'm having fun and, and hopefully get us over nine figures. I'm telling you from what I've seen and, uh, you know, researching what you're doing, I mean, it's definitely, it's going to happen. It's going to happen in due time that the only issue that you're having right now is people finding out about who you are. Uh, man, I, I see great success. I see Green Pal being uh, the next uh, household name like Uber and DoorDash and all these, you know, Lyft and all these big companies. And I mean, I'm like, man, 10 years down the line, man, I, you know, it's like uh, doing the in interview with with Mark Zuckerberg or something about somebody. Like that. <laughs> man, I hope you know, so. Man, I, I had to meet Brian uh, when he was, he was in the middle of it, man, you know, so man, I'm definitely looking forward and I, I, I know I, I really I, like I said I believe in what you do I believe in your I believe in your product I believe in your company and I'm just excited you know just to have you on lead to greatness at this particular time I'm just so excited glad to have you on and definitely blessings to what you're doing and your future endeavors. Thank you, Cedric. I, re I really appreciate that. When we get over the 100 million, I'll come back on and we'll celebrate it. Oh man, let's do it, let's do <laughs> it. If someone wanted to connect with you and what you're doing, where should they go? Yeah, yeah, anybody in the United States uh, hearing this that doesn't wanna waste time mowing your yard or maybe your lawn guy flaked on you, which happens all the time, just download Green Pal in the App Store or the Play Store. Anybody wants to reach me personally, I spend all of my time uh, as far as social on Instagram. You can just hit me up at Brian M. Clayton. Brian, Brian, awesome, awesome, awesome interview. Definitely excited. 
and the Lead to Greatness community is ready. I mean, not they are writing right now, but they're ready to hit the grounds running with this information that was delivered on today. On behalf of the Lead to Greatness community, I want to personally thank you so very much for taking time out of your busy schedule and adding value to us all. Thank you, Cedric. I appreciate you for having me on the show. And don't forget to subscribe to Lead to Greatness if this is your first time. And if this podcast was helpful to you, leave a big thumbs up. And also, I want you to check out our Marriage Coach Podcast, the podcast with my wife and I. If you're on iTunes, please rate this podcast and leave a review and help get the word out. Again, thank you, Lead to Greatness Nation, for joining us on today. Looking forward to seeing you again on next week. Till then, remember, if you help others reach their greatest potential, together we can change the world. Peace. We out.